Hello, dear friend, and good day to you. My hope and prayer for you this day is that God would bless your understanding of his word, and that with us you will put into practice the teachings of the Bible in your life. So let's study God's word. Well, hello, and today... I would like to speak to you on the subject of reading and studying the Word of God. May I say in the beginning there is no substitute for the believer in Christ. He or she must read the Bible. We are people of the book. We depend entirely on the written Word of God. Uh, it alone tells us of God and His salvation. It is the revelation of God. There is natural revelation. The creation of God reflects his glory. We see the creator. Romans chapter 1 tells us that. But we cannot know the gospel by looking at a banana leaf or a mango or some other fruit or vegetable or mountain or sky. We must have special revelation and that is the word of God. So we depend uh, entirely on the written word of God for the revelation of God himself. Uh, it is not enough just to see God in creation. We must know the gospel. Jesus was very clear that life eternal was to know God and to know his son. Uh, that's John chapter 17, verses 1 through 3, a summary of that. The Bible also tells us in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was answering the devil, he said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So it is important for us to have the word of God, and it's important for us to understand the word of God. So let me for a few minutes, if you wouldn't mind today, just speak to you uh, about this word and how we might understand and I'm just going to give you some suggestions, some things that I have found valuable in my life and the life of the churches that I've been associated with, uh, both in Portugal, Mozambique, and also here in the, in the United States. We went through this material here at Trinity Independent Baptist Church uh, last year. Uh, we started on a Sunday, and then we uh, spent several Wednesday evenings going over details but let's just talk for a moment, and we'll see where this goes. And there's a lot of material to cover, so I'm sure this will be several sessions. So thank you for tuning in. Let me say this, that we don't worship the book, but we do worship the God of the book. And it is his word that shows him to us. And so the word of God is extremely important. It is so important that the psalmist said this in Psalm 138 too, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Uh, this was the school verse for the college I attended back in the 80s, Massillon Baptist College. But it is a good verse. And it is a verse that tells us of the importance of the word of God. Uh, there's some things that we should talk about before getting in too far to the actual subject of reading and studying. Several things we need to have down as preliminary issues. Uh, the approach that we make to the Bible is very important. It, how we come to God, how we come to the scriptures. Uh, it's very important, our attitude. First, I would like to notice that we must approach the Bible in a spirit of reverence. It is, after all, the word of God and not the word of man. Paul praised the Thessalonians in his first letter, chapter 2. He said this, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And it's very important how we approach the Word of God. We should, re we should re approach the Word of God as we should approach God in prayer, 
uh, in a very reverent manner. That's what it means to fear God. It's not to be afraid of him, but to fear him in reverence, uh, to have respect for him. And that's very important. Uh, that's important if we're reading the Bible. That's important if we're going to church and, and do what we call worship. Worship uh, is much more the attitude than the music and the actions and the things that we do. It's much more a matter of the heart. Uh, there are a number of things, and I hope we can get into this pretty soon, but uh, worshiping God is a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of the position of the body or the music that we listen to or uh, have the order of service or the liturgy or no liturgy. Uh, it is a matter of the heart, as many things are. Secondly, I think it's important for us that we understand that the Bible is inspired by God. That the very words are important, not just the thoughts. I've been told by people over the years that, well, you know, Jesus talked about fig trees, and we don't know what fig trees are, so we kind of have to just put something else in there so that we understand it. Well, if we do that, we lose all of the culture of the fig tree. And I'm certain that if you just said passion fruit vine instead of grape vine in John chapter 15, you would miss the meaning. Uh, I happen to know, by personal experience, that the treating of a passion fruit vine is not the same as the treatment that we give to a grapevine. And there's a great number of things you can do with a grapevine that you might not be able to do with a passion fruit vine. So you can't just say, well, the vine he meant isn't grapes, it's something else. No, he meant it's grapes. Now, you might never have ever touched a grapevine. You might have eaten grapes, or you might have eaten drink, drank grape juice or something, but maybe you've never touched a grapevine. Maybe you know, oh, know what it means to... Uh, trim the branches uh, during the off season, so that the that the the vine will will uh, operate properly, so it'll live properly, so it'll produce properly. So we can't just change the words however we want them to. Uh, words express thoughts, and the thoughts are important. It's not that at all. But when we start changing the words, we start changing the meaning. So we should understand that the words are inspired. We call that verbal inspiration. I personally believe, and our church believes, and many other people believe, in plenary inspiration, meaning that the whole Bible is inspired. Not just the bits that we like, but the whole Bible. And I'll confess freely that there are parts of the Bible that, are, that present very difficult ideas. They're very hard to understand. They're very hard to accept even, uh, or hard to like. But we can't change what God wrote. That makes us judges over God and his word. So we do need to understand that the Bible is inspired. Uh, John uh, chapter 3, he noticed that Jesus was speaking the words of God, not just the word of God. He said this, he that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent, sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him, speaking about himself. Him who God sent speaketh the words of God. This is chapter 3, the book of John, 33 through 36. He continues, the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So we need to understand uh, one other verse that is brought into attention many times in this subject is Matthew 5.18, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus expresses this idea, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. 
Well, not just the words, but even the, the way the letters are written. Uh, nothing is going to change. You might change it. I might change it. I, I might foolishly decide to take my pen knife and cut up the Bible and, and destroy the parts that I don't like. But when I get to eternity, I will encounter a whole Bible with all those parts. So it is very important that we pay attention to every part of Scripture. The jot and the tittle uh, are the two smallest parts of Hebrew letters. And the presence or absence can make, uh, make the word change meaning. So we can't change the words. Uh, 2 Timothy also gives us very good understanding. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that the word is given by inspiration of God, meaning he breathed his uh, word into men who wrote it down. Second Peter also talks about that. He said that holy men of God were moved as, wrote as they moved or spake as they moved by the Holy Ghost. A more sure word of prophecy is what Peter said, compared with the audible voice that he heard on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we have a more sure word of prophecy. And why a more sure word of prophecy? Do you know that many religions, or at least several religions, rely on oral traditions and that they are relying that for the last thousand or two thousand years, or maybe quite a little bit longer, uh, men have transferred one to another oral arguments or oral teachings. That means that they heard them and they passed them along as they remembered them. Well, you might have played that little telephone game and if you have 20 people in line and you tell the first one and he tells the second one, sometimes it doesn't even get down 20 people before it's changed. Uh, it's not a reliable method. God chose to work, to write his word in a book. Uh, we have the Bible, and the Bible is a collection of 66 books and letters, and those books and letters make up the one whole book. But each part is inspired. If you've ever read the Word of God and, and if you've ever spent any time studying the Word of God, one of the things that you notice right away is the coherence, the, the connection between the old and the new and, and the parts in the old and the parts in the new and, and how the Bible is, is one story. You say, well, it's many stories. Yes, but it's one story. It's the story of God revealing himself to men. And all of those little stories, Gideon and David and Moses and Noah and, and Seth and all of those people, Peter, Paul, and James, and Jesus in the New Testament, all of those stories work together to bring us the story of God coming and revealing himself to man. It tells us about the creation. It tells us where we came from. It tells us why we're in the world. So we need to understand it tells us about our sin and it tells us how we can be saved, how we can be redeemed from the condemnation that is upon us. Now these things are very important, so we need to approach the book as an inspired book, that it is in truth the word of God, as Paul told the Thessalonians. Then a third thing that we might say today is that we should approach the Bible as a spiritual book. It is like no other book ever written. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says this, For the word of God is quick, that means alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto him, unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. It lays our soul bare to God. It discerns the thoughts and intents of our heart. Now what other book does that? What book written by man that 200 or 300 years later, let alone 2,000 years later, can discern the thoughts of man? This is a special book. This is a spiritual book. It is a very unique book. It has very unique characteristics. It's infallible. 
that means it doesn't have any errors because it is the word of God. It is inspired. It's been preserved by God. It, is a, it has a very unique author. You see, God knows the beginning from the ending. He is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the ending. He knows everything from the first to the last. And he knows everything in between, as Dr. Saitler used to say. He knows everything. And therefore, he can reveal whatever he wants to, and what he reveals is certainly true. So there are some benefits to be gained by reading God's Word. Romans 10, 17 says that hearing, faith cometh by hearing. Hearing God's Word produces faith in the believer. And I've often told their congregation, not only here in Kansas City, but also in Africa and in Europe, uh, I've told the congregations that uh, it says faith cometh by hearing, not by reading. But we have to remember that the time that the, the book of Romans was written, uh, quite a lot of the New Testament was not in publication yet. They didn't have a whole Bible. And it isn't like somebody could just download onto their smartphone uh, the Old Testament or the New Testament or pick a language and they get what you want. They couldn't do that. It wasn't available. They hadn't invented electricity yet, if you know what I mean. Of course, it was invented. They just hadn't found it yet. Unless you got hit by lightning or something. <laughs> so, the hearing of God's word produces faith. And by the way, that underscores the importance of, of preaching. And I'll just put that plug in here. Expositional preaching, teaching what the Word of God says. Not making three points in a poem because it's cute and it sounds great and you can yell real loud, but teaching God's Word. Uh, Col Colossians informs us, Colossians what, chapter 1 and verse 9 and 10 uh, encourages us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. Well, how are you going to increase in the knowledge of God? unless you read the Word of God. This, this is one of the benefits. Not only producing faith, but growing in grace and in the knowledge of God. The Bible says to us in 2 Timothy that it is profitable. The Word of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We see that uh, salvation is by grace through faith, not by works. But then he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Well, this verse here in 2 Timothy tells us that the profitable nature of the word of God is for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for telling us where we need to change, for correction, instruction in righteousness. Why? So that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Titus 3, Paul told Titus to uh, teach his people to uh, maintain a pattern of good works. Well, how do you maintain a pattern of good works unless you know how those works, uh, what they work, what they are, and how to produce them in your life. Well, that's the Word of God. That's a benefit. It is profitable. It produces faith in the hearer. We can grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, all these are very basic and by no means the whole story concerning the marvelous book of God. We should move on. And uh, we'll look at several things in our next session, uh, how to read the Bible and how to study it. They aren't the same. Uh, you should get into a regular pattern of reading the Bible. If you want to know what it says, you should get into a regular pattern of Bible reading. The ultimate purpose for such reading and studying is to understand the Bible and to know God better. So Dr. Cummins used to say, Dr. Bruce Cummins, who was my pastor for many years, and um, he was also the founder of the Massillon Baptist Temple, Massillon Baptist College, Massillon Christian School, 
And uh, he used to say on many occasions to us Bible students that there were three rules for understanding the Bible. Three rules for understanding the Bible. He would say, first rule is read the book. The second rule is read the book. And the third rule, you guessed it, read the book. Now, I re found out recently, because I was reading a book that he wrote, that he learned that when he went to college under Dr. J. Frank Norris down in Texas. So, read the book. <laughs> you, you can't understand the book until you read the book. Uh, don't take someone else's word for it. Get a copy of the Word of God and read it for yourself. Uh, very easy to get. If you have a computer, if you have a phone, you can download eSword, you can download uh, several different kinds of programs. You can get but just about any language that has a Bible. You can get it down on your phone, or you can uh, probably go to a church and get one, or you could go to a Bible bookstore. You could probably buy one at the, at the grocery store uh, for two or three or four or five dollars. So don't buy the Twinkies, buy the Bible. They'll be better for you than the Twinkies, believe me. So what I said when we started out this lesson, there is no substitute for the believer in Christ. He or she must read the Bible. Well, I'm your host, Alan Hart, and I thank you for tuning into this first session. And over the next couple of months, we'll try to get up as many of these as we can and uh, on this subject and other subjects. Uh, if you're tuning into our YouTube channel, make sure that you like us and subscribe to us. But also, uh, if you have questions, there'll be a link there for you to ask questions, and I will try to get to those uh, as best I can to answer the questions that you might have about the Word of God. So thank you for tuning in, and until next time, uh, have a good day, neighbor. Thank you. Goodbye.